I, I have to begin with a short and quick personal confession uh, about this interest uh, for Chernobyl films, which uh, dates back in the pre-HBO series era, uh, when I've met um, forensic researcher Susan Shupley's text uh, entitled The Most Dangerous Film of the World, about Vladimir Shevchenko's uh, first original documentary on Chernobyl nuclear reactor meltdown, Chronicle of a Difficult Week, which was shot right um, in the first days and weeks after the accident. Uh, when Shevchenko 30, uh, Shevchenko's 35 millimeter footage was later developed, he noticed that um, a portion of the film was heavily uh, pockmarked and carried extraneous static interference and noise. Uh, thinking initially that the film stock used uh, may have been defective, Shevchenko finally realized that what he had captured on film was exactly the image and sound of radioactivity itself. So I would like to show those um, one minute uh, excerpt when he um, actually com commands on the on the this part of the. Um, maybe we should turn the lights off, thanks. Yes, we can have the lights. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Um, so, um, if uh, nuclear radiation seems and feels to be a very sensual cinematic topic in the front of Shevchenko's camera, which actually cost the life of the filmmaker, actually it is not. Documentaries about Chernobyl accident constitute a rich and diverse corpus of multiple representations and interpretations. Audiovisual <coughs> filming documentation of the nuclear catastrophe began right after some days of the explosion at the end of April 1986 and still remained a very popular topic of different documentaries, tourist videos, TV broadcasts and multimedia artistic projects. Beside the various discursive strategies by which they inform, narrate, commemorate and make sense of the disaster, Non-fiction films struggle with many challenges. Some of them, uh, uh, some of these challenges may be conducting a preparatory research, a detective work of finding and checking the many often competing facts and information about the explosion, and at the same time facing the countless unknown details surrounding the subject. And the other is maybe the paradoxical cinematic challenge of creating retrospectively the Chernobyl atmosphere by catching, collecting, documenting the various effects of invisible radiation on humans, natural and built environments in the area. I would like to add a short note to the quotation marks um, around the name Chernobyl. Uh, for at least two reasons, as Chernobyl was not the single place affected by the catastrophe, the transcription of the Russian name of the place does not indicate that today is part of Ukraine, which implicates a differently written and pronounced name, Chernobyl, and the most contaminated areas today are parts of Belarus, which, in which language there is another <coughs> name uh, for it, Chernobyl. In addition, by, mean, by mentioning Chernobyl, we no longer mean the village, the place itself, which lost its original self-referentiality. And today struggles with multiple meanings which exceed into what Olga Bryukovetska calls master signifier or key symbol, comparable to Hiroshima, also in quotation marks. The groups of films I've, uh, I've met, or I've, uh, I know, uh, may be sorted by their main subject and former strategies in 
films dealing with uh, natural lives and uh, animals, the flora and fauna in the contaminated area like uh, radioactive wolves and Chernobyl and animal takeover, um, talking with scientists and usually taking the form of television wildlife documentaries dealing with the environmental effects of radiation. But the biggest uh, group of the films deal with the um, anthropological effects on people, different, group, different groups, for example, children, like uh, children health problems like Chernobyl Heart or Children of Chernobyl. Uh, other films deal with liquidators, the soldiers and civilians helping in the cleaning um, process. Uh, others are focusing on or, or talking with villagers still living in the contaminated area like Babushkas of Chernobyl. Uh, others talk with the workers uh, uh, on the um, today uh, power plant, uh, like uh, Nicholas Gellihartel, Pripyat, and many others. And so in some cases, they uh, portrait of a cho uh, chosen single survivor who have a very special story to tell, like White Horse, The Voice of Ludmila, Lost Paradise, or the Oscar-winning Russian woodpecker. Uh, with a group of them uh, trying to reconstruct the original events like the Bell of Chernobyl or inside Chernobyl sarcophagus, both of them have two uh, episodes um, in, in 10 years uh, difference. And many, many uh, trying to give a general overview of Chernobyl, um, mostly their number raises uh, on the occasions of anniversaries but they could, in, uh, uh, most of them could be considered media journalism or TV documentaries, but there are some individual projects of documentary filmmakers too. And there is the very exciting uh, corpus of uh, experimental films, often mixing different media uh, in the form of uh, multimedia projects, like animation with live footage or photographs or uh, staging um, some artistic reenactments of the uh, original uh, event. Uh, the documentaries usually combine interviews with experts, scientists, historians, doctors, journalists, researchers, survivors, relatives, tourists and guides. And the visual world is shaped by archival footage, excerpts of previous numerous fiction films, TV series and the famous video game about Chernobyl Stalker. Uh, which is most important for me was that they typically alternate between the four representative sites, places of exclusion zone. First was the reactor, the original reactor, um, today with the shelter and the sarcophagus above it, or the neighboring reactor buildings with ha which have a similar structure, the natural landscape, the village households, and uh, for the abandoned buildings of Pripyat, uh, the closest city where the workers from the reactor lived. Uh, the, the films uh, of very frequently take the motive of traveling, approaching the side, wandering, taking the form of a road movie. This could be closely related to the fact that, I don't know if you see the names of the filmmakers, most uh, of them are typically made by foreign filmmakers, um, embodying an outsider perspective, a, a tourist gaze, uh, which is not, which probably there are uh, others made by um, Ukrainian, Belarusian or Russian filmmakers, but I didn't uh, find too many of them. Uh, the term uh, I propose uh, in the context of Chernobyl documentaries, this posthuman picturesque, is closely linked to the once utopian socialist city, Pripyat, founded in 2070, to house the workers and the staff of nuclear power plant. After the quickly executed evacuation of almost 50,000 of inhabitants, Pripyat over the years gradually became an uninhabited ghost town, conserving the material traces of socialist architecture and everyday life in the 80s. Simultaneously preserving the traces of a not so distant past human presence and the signs of temporally developing decay, the public places, buildings, blocks of flats offer themselves as material documents of indescribable consequences under, under, indirectly caused by nuclear explosion. Um, by um, using, uh, incorporating the images of these sites, these documentaries are able to catch the impalpable, unperceivable radioactive radiation and work through the complexity of traumas induced by the disaster. Uh, my examples are taken from two films, Phil Grabsky's Heavy Water and uh, Frederick uh, Cousseau's and Blandin Uick's A Sunday in Pripyat, Pripyat, both made in 2006. 
uh, which uh, both of them, instead of interviewing the survivors and witnesses, leave the task of telling the stories uh, and making sense of the, of the disaster to this kind of uh, posthuman uh, picture act. So before talking about this concept a little bit um, detailed, I would like to show two very short clips from the, from the two films and then to uh, talk about them. So the lights, please. Uh, take the lights off, thanks. And, uh, Trying to this hospital has a room for weak. It has no creche, no canteen, no washroom queue, only this queue for weeping. No lost property booth, no complaints department or reception. No office of second opinion, of second chances. Its sons and daughters die with surprise in their faces. But mothers must not cry before them. There is a room for weeping. the staff are trying. Sometimes they use oh, the room then. I should stop you. Yes. Sorry. And the, uh, so this was uh, a part from uh, Philip Grafsky's Heavy Water. And the other one is um, Frederick Cousseau's and uh, Blandenuk's uh, Sunday in Pripyat. Um, in both films, images and sounds act independently. While showing the decaying environment, Heavy Water uses Mario Petrucci's poems inspired by Svetlana Alexievich, which is oral histories, a Sunday in Pripyat, uh, ambient sounds and noises, and voice material of survivors' uh, recollection. Um, as uh, David Marshall shows, even the 18th century descriptions of the picturesque by William Gilpin contain the idea of a peculiar kind of beauty which is agreeable in a picture. Contrasting with the category of, uh, the cate the category of beauty which is characterized by smoothness, Gilpin emphasized the roughness of the picturesque, the qualities of roughness and of sudden variation joined with the irregularity are the most efficient uses of the picturesque, as, as he puts it. The picture expounds pleasure in roughness and irregularity, he continues, curious details and interesting textures, which is expressed in Gilpin's enthusiasm for ruins, which for him are privileged sites of the picturesque. Marshall also quotes Shaftesbury's fascination with wilderness, when nature appears in rude rocks, mossy caverns, and I quote, the irregular unrolled grottoes and broken falls of water with all horrid graces of the wilderness itself. As Marshall concludes, 
I quote, it was pre precisely in the uncanny weavering between the absent and the present, the art and artifice, as well as between reality and representation, that the aesthetics of the picturesque takes place. The reason why Pripyat's images embody a kind of posthuman picturesque in these documentaries, I think, are the special condition of these ruins. Gavin Lucas, in a book about the archaeology of the contemporary world, calls recent ruins material sites where contemporary past is inscribed. Ruins from the 18th century embedded an ambivalence. They acted both as memento mori, testaments of mortality of all things, just as human skeleton or rotting corpse signal the death of human body, ruin buildings signal the end of society or culture. On the other hand, ruins acted as monuments, hinting the possibility of immortality through material presence, reminders of civilization, of where of life. Recent or contemporary ruins differ from classic ones as they are not authentic in the sense as Georg Simmel understood it in 1911, stating that ruins balance the tension between two forces of nature and human, nature transforming human labor into something new again. Pripyat ruins, as many recent ruins, are kind of counter monuments, using archaeologist Alfredo Gonzalez Ruba's term. Instead of serving to commemorate, they materialize oblivion. They are not carefully managed or preserved sites, part of conventional heritage strategies, but sites where decay and entropy are in full swing, with little or no attempt of intervention. The images uh, of posthuman pictures in the documentaries constantly pose the questions. Where are the people? What happened? Why did they live? The uh, anthropological, individual and collective, national, transnational uh, and environmental, ecological traumas caused by Chernobyl nuclear catastrophe are dizzying even to attempt to map. Psychologist Lynn Barnett in 2006 underlines the, the meltdown of the reactor was just the beginning of a catastrophe that, countries, uh, uh, that continues to affect thousands of people in many parts of Europe, particularly the three countries closest to the reactor, Ukraine, Belarus and Russia. The psychological factors surrounding the Chernobyl disaster include, and I quote him, sudden trauma of evacuation, long-term effects of being a refugee, disruption of social networks, illness, separation and its effects on families, children's perception and effects on their development, and the threat of long-term consequence with an endless future." Uh, unquote. Added to this was the breakdown of the Soviet Union with consequent collapse of health services, increasing unemployment, poverty and malnutrition. In the lack of sudden sensory overload was missing in the um, after the uh, events, the unseen, unheard, unfed and unsmelled terror, as Lynn Barnett calls it, uh, was too difficult for people to fight against or even sometimes to, to, to be afraid of. Many understood and realized only retrospectively the danger to which they have been exposed and re-experienced it as traumatic. Uh, one of the central questions of trauma theory launched in the 90s by the writings of Cathy Carruth, Shoshana Feldman, Dora, and Dori Laub was the question that how it is possible to bear witness of traumatic events like the Second World War or Holocaust. According to the psychoanalytic assumption, trauma constitutes such an overwhelming powerful shock that it is impossible to absorb immediately by the psyche. Thus, their time is needed in order to shape the bits and pieces of unassimilated, incom incomprehensible memory into any kind of testimony. Besides that, narrating traumatic events is also difficult because trauma escapes direct verbal expression. Mm -hmm. Thus, witnessing is a careful reconstruction of incoherent memories into coherent whole. This raises questions of the trauma's representability in memory, language or any other media. As Feldman puts it, I quote, if trauma is a senseless shock, a pure hit that cannot be absorbed into human psyche, then how it is to be narrated and spoken out. Uh, in addition to this, in the case of nuclear trauma and media, radiation skips representation. Uh, philosopher Timothy Morton raises an environmental perspective beyond materialism and here and now. 
uh, in his 2013 books, Hyper Objects, Philosophy and Ecology After the End of the World, he introduces the concept of hyper objects, which are large scale configurations and refer, I quote, refer to things that are massively distributed in time and space relative to humans. His examples include black holes, the solar system, global warming, or I quote him, the sum of total nuclear material on the Earth. Morton's theory retains a heuristic quality in conceptualizing a materialistic perspective on the invisible, odorless, impalpable <coughs> nuclear radiation, which is the very topic of Chernobyl documentaries. Among their numerous, uh, numerous properties which they have in common, hyperobjects are characterized, for example, by viscosity. They stick to beings, objects that are involved with them. There is no way to resist or escape a hyperobject. And second, they are characterized by non-locality as they are so massively distributed in space and time that cannot be tied to or displayed in local manifestation, which is both very characteristic for global warming or radioactive pollution. Third, they involve profoundly different temporalities than the human scale ones we are used to. Note for comparison, the half-life of uranium is 700 million years. Hyperobjects um, can be characterized by phasing, uh, meaning that they occupy a higher dimensional space than other entities can normally perceive. Uh, radiation is not directly perceivable for human senses, that's why all the tourists uh, uh, use the Geiger counter when they enter exclusion zone and many workers uh, there. And finally, hyperobjects they exhibit uh, their effects interobjectively. That is, they are formed by relations between more than one object. They express, reveal themselves only by their imprint or footprint. In the case of radiation, temporarily unfolding diseases, deformations, and contamination that are plus the graspable psychological effects. This very much resonates with Rob Nixon's uh, concept of uh, slow uh, violence. Um, which uh, is not an immediate, explosive, spectacular and visible form of violence customarily conceived. For Nixon, climate change, deforestation, the radioactive aftermaths um, constitute the most emergent examples of so violence, which, I quote him, occurs gradually and out of sight, a violence of delayed destruction. Nixon is one of the authors concerned about how cult culture handles these phenomena. The relative invisibility of slowly unfolding environmental catastrophes for him, I quote, present formidable representational and narrative obstacles that can hinder efforts to mobilize and act decisively. In the lack of these, as Nixon states, the long dyings, both human and ecological, that result from slow violence, I quote him, we remain underrepresented in strategic planning as well as in human memory. Um, so uh, I, I think in, in, a, in a form of a, a conclusion, I can sum these all up uh, in, uh, in the thoughts that uh, heavy water and um, Sunday in Pripyat, these two examples were through these images of uh, posthuman uh, picturesque capture the traces of the slow violence of the hyperobject of radiation. The separated but concordant visual and sonic layers in both films offer fragmentary broken impressions and sensual details of past events. Thus the spectator is transformed into a late witness and is not liberated from working with the painful elements of trauma. Temporal boundaries collapse, past, present and future seem to overlap. By capturing the uncanny interwoven presence of an earlier human touch, present, present decay and expanding natural environment, images of post-human pictures equally serve as a representation and a working through of human trauma which is invisible and has such a prolonged effect as radiation itself. Thank you. Thank you very much.